Hello, good morning. My name is Anne Kubrick, and you are tuned to Seven the Niger Delta with Anne Kubrick. Today is a Wednesday, and today is the 7th of October, 2020. I hope you've had a good week. Um, I hope everything is gone and will continue to go well for you, for us. Um, Saving the Niger Delta with Anne Kubrick is uh, your program, my program. For the past eight years, we have been on air more than we have not been. And we have steadfastly driven um, the issues that concerns the Niger Delta region, the issues that concerns um, liberty, equity, justice, in whatever form it comes, in Nigeria, in Southern Nigeria, in the ways that it affects us, whether it is positive or negative. But unfortunately, the issues that we discuss, uh, saving the Niger Delta, are the issues that are thrown up in the, in the uh, government, in the system of governance in Nigeria. And stand up, stand up. Stand up for your right. Get up. We are the victims of what we discuss. We are the victims of what is happening in um, in Nigeria, whether it's developmental, security, insecurity, um, justice, whether it's um, things to do with um, employment how the government is run, so many, many, um, so many, many things. And quite honestly, in the past five to six years, we have just gone from, um, from bad to worse. Now, we're back again to the issues of restructuring, no restructuring. Uh, the people who want uh, to restructure Nigeria are people who have failed. I just went... Uh, I just went on um, on the internet to look for the latest uh, position on on restructuring, and it is horrifying to see that uh, today, on the seventh of October at nine thirty a.m., um, the uh, the latest input on the issue of restructuring, the title on Vanguard Online, the title is restructuring. Mantra of those that lost out in power game. Now, when, when I look at this, and there are so many different positions, a lot of people are speaking right now on restructuring or not restructuring. And that is why we are wondering today that restructuring, the North says no, the South says yes. In the past few days, um, the Northern Elders Forum, Arewa, so many different uh, voices have come up um, to say, you must restructure, you must not restructure, you cannot restructure, you must go to the National Assembly, you must not go to the National Assembly, it is not in the Constitution, it is in the Constitution. So many, many things are thrown up. But no matter what is thrown up, the reality, the reality is that we must restructure Nigeria. We have come to a dead end. Restructure Nigeria. Restructure, what is the meaning of restructure? Restructure means you do something differently from the way that you are doing it. And so the issues that we have spoken about in the past, the issues that people before us have spoken about in the past, is basically about restructuring. The 12-day war of, that was declared by Adakabolo in February in 1966, 
was about restructuring. Whichever way you look at it, the bottom end was that he wanted something different. He wanted something different from what was on ground. So by declaring a Niger Delta Republic, he has taken to restructuring. Um, the, when the military took over, in 19, uh, uh, perpetrated the coup in 1966, they restructured. They restructured Nigeria from the way it was that they complained about and taking over. That's a form of restructuring. You can describe it as restructured. The, um, the issue that led to the, um, to the civil war, the issue that led to um, Odumegu Ojuku declaring um, uh, independence from Nigeria was the same thing. He restructured, he moved away. He didn't want to be part, and he had his reasons. It isn't the argument or the discussion is not whether his reasons were right or wrong, because to him, his reasons were right. And remembering the reasons, I was old enough to remember, I was in secondary school, when, um, when um, Adaka Boro declared the Republic of Niger Delta. I was in secondary school, so I remember. When Ojuku declared independence, I was in secondary school. I remember because it was the same year. So, the, um, so what I'm therefore um, um, saying is that no matter how we look at it, whether we like restructuring, whether you're on the side that accepts restructuring and the majority of the people in the South want a restructured Nigeria, because a restructured Nigeria is not necessarily or effectively a broken Nigeria. It is not. A restructured Nigeria is a changed Nigeria. But Nigeria have reached the point where some people don't want a restructured Nigeria. They want a break away from Nigeria. Some people want a restructured Nigeria. And that restructured Nigeria is not to break away from Nigeria, but to change the system, to change the policies that run Nigeria, to change the constitution. Whether people are talking about um, 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 changing the constitution by changing one thing, one section after the other, or outrightly agreeing that this 1999 constitution is not a Nigerian constitution because we, the people that are so-called Nigerians, did not sit down and write this constitution. Now, Nigeria, when you look at how nations are formed, there is the argument that Nigeria um, was created by God. I don't accept that. God created the people that make up Nigeria. God did not create Nigeria. He did not. He created the people that Lugard came and brought together as Nigerians. When the Portuguese and Lugard and the and the um, and the Fulani uh, um, warriors, the uh, um, the jihadis were coming in from North, uh, from North Africa into what is today Northern Nigeria. There was no Nigeria as we have it today. There was none. But the people that were there were, were there when all of these things were going on. So you cannot accept that Nigeria was created by us. We didn't create Nigeria. Nigeria was created by Lugard. Now, Nigeria being created by Lugard, the, the discussion today, 100 years after, is because Lugard um, created Nigeria does not necessarily mean that, does not necessarily mean that we must continue to stay in the, in the Nigeria 
that Lugal created. We can change Nigeria. We can have, um, we can have, we can have Nigeria without the uh, the method and the pattern that um, uh, that um, that Lugard uh, cre uh, that Lugard created. So we must make changes. We must make changes. We must make changes in Nigeria. If Nigeria must stay together. We cannot be afraid to sit down. We cannot be afraid of each other. I, I refuse to be afraid of anybody that is a Nigerian, whether you are 100 years old or whatever, whether you are um, 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 a king or whatever. I will not be afraid of you when I am talking about my rights within where I find myself, I find myself here just the way everybody else found themselves here. For some people, a hundred years and uh, some years after the creation of Nigeria, for the economic interest of the British Empire, we have a right to discuss whether we should continue on the path for which this country was created, or we should change this country for it to work for each and every one of us, each and every one of us. So when we say, let us restructure Nigeria, we are not first and foremost saying, let us break Nigeria. And even if there are people who say they want to be, uh, no long, they, they no longer want to be part of Nigeria, they still have a right to sit down and explain their reasons. And we have a responsibility to listen to each other. The people who are rejecting restructuring, we're hearing them and we're seeing and hearing why they don't want Nigeria to be restructured. We that want a restructured Nigeria must also be listened to. If two people are arguing over something and they cannot come to an amicable decision, on that issue they are arguing about. You cannot force them to agree one to the other. You must find a way to allow them to keep what it is that they want without it turning into a violent situation. But quite honestly, it is ridiculous unacceptable that we should find ourselves in this country today where a group of people are saying it is their way or no way. They have had it, the North have had it, have had it, has had it their way since the amalgamation of Nigeria. Now, if for some reason some people like us who have been in this same amalgamation with them and it has not worked out for us and we've come to that realization, we have a right to voice that realization and to say that this is how we want it. When the, um, our uh, leaders before us before independence, were um, fighting for independence of uh, Nigeria from the colonial government. When I say fight, we didn't carry arms to fight the British government like they did uh, in Kenya and, um, and other places in Africa. Maybe if we did, um, we may be looking at things differently, but we didn't. It was a discussion 
that led to independence of Nigeria. So to say that if we say we want a discussion, that means we want war, is not true. And it is, a, it is an unjust, unfair, and an unacceptable um, narrative that is being driven by some people. Now, when this independence was being discussed, people like uh, San Antonio and Ahorodem, uh, Wolowozik, and all these people, Sadu uh, um, uh, Amadu Bello, Sadano Sokoto, and all of that, Okotiebo, uh, Azikiwe, when all these discussions were going on, Nigeria could have been independent much earlier. But it is the North. Today now, it is the people that we, that have come after them and have read the historical facts, are realizing that it is the Fulanis. But it was rejected by them that they didn't want to be independent now. It was the British that convinced them that it was better for them to stay with us in Nigeria because of the oil. Therefore, it, 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 it is logical to then argue that the British government at that time, in the 50s, already knew that there was oil, apart from palm oil, they already knew that there was crude oil in the Niger Delta region. But they did not give us that information until a bit later on. So the speculation is that they were even exporting crude oil earlier than they said in 1958 that they were exporting crude oil because we were ignorant. Our leaders didn't know that there was such a thing as crude oil. So this, this is um, a part of the, of the discussion. Now, eventually, the North agreed under some arrangement, <clears throat> excuse me, with the British government. And the British government were not dwelling on it, but the British government today cannot run away from the facts of what the British uh, government did in those days to Southerners. So they were telling the North one thing, and they were telling the Southerners a different thing. The fact that they manipulated, the fact that the, the census was manipulated against the Serbs is very clear. It's an accepted fact, and it's there. If you want anybody who wants to research it, can get it. So every step of the way of preparing for independence <clears throat> and every step of the way to maintaining the amalgamation and going into independence was done in favor of what the British believed is going to work in their favor primarily with people that they have chosen as collaborators in the Nigeria that they have created. And they clearly saw the people of Southern Nigeria as a people that they cannot manipulate. They were able to manipulate us up to some extent, but they could not manipulate us 100%. So we were a problem right from the beginning for them. So going forward, how independence, how we became independent, the circumstances of independence worked against us. It was later on that we began to, uh, to realize it. But even at that, in realizing it, we were still in the South not able to do anything about this realization in our favor. So, because I came to ask myself, how was it actually that before independence, when the, the British were creating regions, how did they get to create um, Western region, 
How did they get to create northern region and eastern region? Where was south? Because in a map of a country, there is not south, east, west. So where was southern Nigeria? When it suited them, southern Nigeria is southern Nigeria. And that means when the north is the north, and then south is south. So the, the Yorubas, Ndibo, and all the ethnic nationalities of the Niger Delta region were put in southern Nigeria. When it suited them, they had western Nigeria, eastern Nigeria, and northern Nigeria. So what happened to us? I'll tell you what happened to us. We were put in eastern Nigeria. So was southern Nigeria just vacant, floating in the air, didn't exist? These are questions that our leaders at that time maybe did not ask or maybe did ask and were not given answers. But it is still this same system that held meetings leading up to independence in the United Kingdom, in Lancaster House, here and there, that came up with what is called the Wellings Report that described the Niger Delta area precisely as it is today. That was how it was described over nearly 60 years, uh, more than 60 years ago, actually, before independence, as a neglected area, hard to develop area of Nigeria. And that the, the region, the Niger Delta region, needed a lot more to develop at every stage, at every step of the way, if you're building road kilometer by kilometer, it is difficult and more expensive to uh, give people in the creeks where I come from and in the mouth of the Atlantic Ocean, things like road, things like hospital, things like schools, it is more difficult to give it to us than it is and more expensive than it is to give it to other people in other parts of Nigeria. And yet, and yet, sadly and painfully, the, the, um, the revenue that was being used to develop the North was coming from the South. And this is the time that, uh, this is precisely why um, uh, the, the amalgamation took place. Because Britain was running the Northern and Southern Protectorate at a loss when it comes to the North. It was, it was, running, um, it, it was running Southern Nigeria with, um, with surplus. When it took everything it wanted to take, how it wanted to take it, there was still a balance left in their accounts from the money that was being generated in southern Nigeria. And in northern Nigeria, there was none because they were, they, they were taking money from uh, uh, southern Nigeria to run northern Nigeria. And that was why they amalgamated us. These are historical facts. And we can't talk about today without talking about 100 years ago, because it is what happened 100 years ago that is justifying what is happening today and what will happen tomorrow. And what is happening today is that we're asking for a restructured Nigeria. If, if the idea is that we should stay in Nigeria as a people, if you're from Ogoni, if you're from Ipere, if you're from Ishakiri, Urobo, any of these places that is God has endowed with natural wealth. If expected 
to stay in Nigeria if we are expected to want to stay in Nigeria. This discussion of restructuring must take place. I was listening to um, um, a gentleman, a professor, Professor um, Yusuf, this morning on Arise Television, and I will go back and read some of the things that he had, uh, he had written about. I, I could see a man that was, he was vibrating, and he said he is a Fulani man back and front, and that he has two passports, and that the Fulanis are people that have moved around Africa. He didn't even say for hundreds of years, he says for thousands of years that the Fulanis have moved backwards and forwards from uh, across Africa. And that we are talking about Ruga, this Ruga, that this was how he was. He, I'm just demonstrating the way he was. He's a very intelligent, brilliant, well-spoken man. He's lived abroad. He has a, he has a very clean American uh, uh, external type of accent. You can understand him um, very well, very clearly. There is no mispronunciation, miss um, anything. You can understand him very well. So this is the point he was making against restructuring. He was projecting the fact that Niger Delta people are the cause of their problem and that the governors are to be blamed. He was mentioning NDDC and I, I was, I just watched in disbelief that here he is vibrating, defending Ruga by what he was saying that nobody can stop Ruga, that it must go on. They have a right to move, uh, they've been moving around. And therefore, if they want to settle down, which is Ruga, that they have a right to settle down. So that he didn't, um, he, what he's insinuating therefore is that they have a right to settle anywhere they choose. Bros, you don't have that right. You don't have it. You may want to have it and you, 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 you're doing it forcefully, that you must have it. And he's saying that the waters, he brought in the water bill, the waters belongs to everybody, and that the people who have water cannot drink it alone. So, so you begin to see that by the time we get to hear of things that are happening and start rising against it, it's already finished. That's why a lawmaker, a lawmaker can get up and say the water resources bill is a done deal. That's why they can say that. And this water resources bill, this is not the first time it has come up. It came up in the Eighth Assembly. And whatever way, for whatever reason, you look at Akwabio, Akwabio stood up that time and along with other, other Southerners and other uh, lawmakers, were able to drop this um, water resources uh, bill. So by the time the, the Ninth Assembly came in, and the president of the Senate says that any bill that the president brings to this Ninth Assembly Anything it is, it will be passed. So the water bill that will take six kilometers of land from the point where the water meets the land, I'm simplifying the, uh, the issues because I need to simplify it for all of us to understand it because the majority of us, the people that will rise and say no, the woman picking periwinkle in Abonima swamps and the mangrove, the fisherman that is fishing the polluted fish that Shell and federal government have polluted for us and the other oil companies have polluted for us and the private uh, oil well owners in our backyard. 
that have polluted our waters. This, um, this fish and um, delicacies, ngolo, isam, ingwe, ofingo, all these things, uh, songu, all these things that we eat, we are being told that if the water bill is passed, these things belong to federal government. And I keep saying this, if anybody remembers the story of Finima, Finima is an Ijo clan, an Ijo community in the Atlantic, uh, at the mouth of the Atlantic Ocean around Bo uh, Boni and next to Boni and, uh, and stuff like that. Now, if the land six kilometers belongs to federal government. Let me use my own community, Abonima. Abonima is not up to six kilometers from the beginning of the community to the end of the community. Horizontally or vertically, it is not up to six kilometers. So basically, what we are told is that if your land falls within six kilometers of your community, it belongs to the federal government. And therefore, what happened to Finima can happen, can happen to us. They can bring people to that community and remove people from that community because it's federal government land. So this is not about political party. This is about politics and policies that is being put in place or have been put or has been put in place against us, against you and I. If you're from Southern Nigeria, if you're from the Middle Belt and you have water touching any part of your land, whether it's salt water or fresh drinking water, it doesn't matter, it's water. And these days you can turn salt water into drinking water. So it really doesn't matter. What they are after is water. But we cannot access their gold or any other mineral, solid or otherwise, that they may have outside of southern Nigeria. We cannot access them. I read online today that uh, Zamfara State, I think that's where the gold uh, is coming from, have already struck a deal. The state have struck a deal with Central Bank that runs into billions of Naira. Wike, uh, Didi, um, Okoa, um, um, Emmanuel of, um, well, um, of Akwaibo, Obaseki, and um, Ben of Cross River. And the people of these states, of the brave states, cannot strike a deal with any oil company or cannot bring in an oil company and kill bricks and you cannot have an oil well or have a, a refinery. The federal government, when Jonathan was in, um, uh, in power, Jonathan wanted to sell off the, privatize the, um, the refineries and it was resisted. It was resisted by the very um, workers, by the workers of um, in oil and gas, uh, Nupeng and all those people resisted it. Today now they've lost their voices. They cannot resist it because already that is what this federal government um, have done. So we need as a people to sit down and conduct a referendum amongst ourselves. You cannot tell me it's not in the constitution. If my government asks me a question and I answer, if I'm given a, an A or B question and I answer, that's referendum. That is referendum. Referendum is very simply, you choose one option as opposed to the other. So that at the end of the day, 
that's uh, what researchers do. That is what poll, uh, uh, people who do poll opinion and things like that, that's what they do. They ask you questions and you answer. And then they say, oh, 80% is in favor, 20% is not in favor. That's a referendum. People wake up. That's a referendum. How does that break up a country? If you have a referendum, it is with the answers that you're going to work. And that is why we must have move forward to restructure Nigeria. Now, people are planning for, I'm going into politics now, people are planning for 2023 election. And I'm, I keep saying that in my opinion, there is no plan for election as it should be as it is all over the world. There is no plan to have election even as we know it in Nigeria with the rigging and all those things. There is no election as we know it that will take place in 2020. What is going to happen in 2020 has already been decided in the name of election. It has already been decided. And what politicians are doing is already back data, is already, is, it doesn't make sense. When a political party is going to say that in 2023, while we have a government of northern extraction that is supposed to and must leave power in 2023 that have served eight years is going to leave and will leave when an election has taken place has taken place and a winner has emerged a political party is saying that it will not stop any other any um, any person from presenting themselves on that political party. Well, any political party, whether it's uh, APC or BDP, that does that, that person is working, that political party is working for itself and the people that run that political party. Because if you want to be fair, if you want to be fair, you cannot feel a northern candidate on any political party if you're asking for justice when a northerner is leaving an eight-year tenure how does that make sense so it doesn't matter whether it's apc or pdp they cannot feel i'm not a politician no. you cannot feel somebody from the north even if the person is a christian you cannot feel that person because it's from the north unless there are changes made. So, because we're going by north and south. Now, if we're going by north and south, then you cannot feel the northerner. There is nothing like um, uh, Ankyo does not like uh, northerners. No, there is nothing like that. You cannot feel a northerner in 2023 election, full stop. And it must come to the south. It must come to the south. If it comes to the South, it cannot, in all good conscience, if we are, if you are coming to equity, you must come with clean hands. If the election will hold, whichever way they want to hold it, if it will hold in 2023, it cannot go to the Southwest because the Southwest have done eight years in Obasanjo, the South and North, irrespective of the injustice of um, 17 states and 19 states, the South and the, and the North luckily have three zones each, thank God. So if the North decides, the, the, uh, the, the North of Nigeria decides that they are, uh, they are their turn to produce a president of northern extraction 
which includes for now, which includes all the Middle West states and all the Christian states, if they decide that Northern president means a Muslim president, if they decide that Northern president must come only from one, um, uh, from one uh, state, after all, Yaradua was from Katsina state, and the next uh, Northern president and Muslim president after him is also from Katsina state. So if that is their decision, it's not our business. But if we are talking of equity and justice, we cannot say that when it rotates to the South, which it must in 2023, that it should go to the Yoruba. There is no contextual. I mean, there is nothing that justifies the presidency going to the Southwest at all. Nothing. So that's one aside. The, the Niger Delta, the South South, I prefer Niger Delta, the South South, politically, have done four elective years. People who, were, who attended school and know that uh, 2010 to 2011 is 12 months, is one year. May 2000, and, um, and God is so wonderful. He didn't make mistake. Yara Dua unfortunately died on, on the 5th. He was buried on the, on the 6th, and uh, Jonathan was sworn in on the 6th. Elections were held. Jonathan was sworn in on, um, on the 29th. That's, that's 12 months. And Jonathan was not elected at the swearing in of 2010. So the argument the nonsensical argument that our politicians refuse to stand up against, that Jonathan has been sworn in twice, does not hold. Because he was not elected in 2010. The constitution is what made him the president of Nigeria between 2010 and 2011 by the unfortunate demise of Yara Dua, which had nothing to do with good luck Jonathan. Good luck Jonathan was contending to be the governor of Bayelsa State. He didn't present himself as a candidate for vice president. We were fighting for ownership, control, and management of our resources. It had nothing to do with presidency. That man proposes, God, uh, God disposes. So God allowed a situation that took place that a group of people who are one person manipulated the picking of Yaradua and the picking of Good Luck Jonathan, and history has the rest. So when Jonathan became president for that one year, his one year, he was he ran for election and won election and became a four a four-year tenure president. And he accepted that he lost election in 20 um, in 2015. So basically, that's five years. So if that's five years, the one year is not his tenure. So he should have done another tenure, but he didn't win the election, so he didn't do another tenure. Now, equity, equity. If the, the presidential uh, uh, rotates to, the presidency rotates to the South, which it must, and it will, um, the next people in line, by understanding and appreciation and just by doing the right thing, sometimes you step back so that justice can affect itself for the future. Then I would stand with the clamor of the Igbos for the presidency to rotate to the Igbos when it comes to the South in 2023. Now, I'm not in a position to choose for them who they want, how they want it, in what political party that they want to, that they want to uh, present their, their candidate. But what is happening now, and have been happening for the past uh, one and a half years, it's been building up, is that the very people, the North, the very controllers, the people who believe they own Nigeria, are the ones who are choosing and putting out the narrative 
of which southerner, from which uh, zone of the south, up to the point of from which state is going to run for president. I'm saying that as a people of southern Nigeria, the Yorubas, the Igbos, and all the ethnic nationalities in, um, in the south, nobody has a right to make those choices for us. We have to make those choices ourselves. Nobody has a right to tell us it must come from the southeast, it must come from the southwest or the south-south. We must make those choices for ourselves. That's justice and equity. So that, that's why I say I'm going into politics. So I want to highlight to us, our people, that these decisions, these very critical political decisions, that our very existence and the future of our region, our ethnic nationality, our children's future is hanging on these decisions. We cannot, we must not allow anybody to make those decisions for us. If we were allowed in the South to make the decision for the North, when um, Buhari got, um, got uh, the ticket, we would not have chosen Buhari. We would not for the North. We would not have chosen Buhari for the North. They chose Buhari for themselves. Why should they come and choose who will be the president from the South? Why? Why should they even have a say in who's going to be president from the, uh, from the Southern part of Nigeria? Why should they have a say? They do. They have a say in who is governor. They have a say in who is elected. Even local government chairman go to the party at a, at a federal level to go and get a blessing, whatever they call that nonsense they do, to get blessing, to come and be local government chairman in my, in my state. You have to go to Abuja. But Abuja does not come to you. Uh, 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 do people from Katsina come, uh, uh, come to Governor Wike here? to bless them before they can be local government chairman. No. You know, so these are the issues. And when I hear the discussions of restructuring, as if restructuring is brain surgery. It's not brain surgery, please. Even divorce can be a liking to restructuring. Divorce can be likened to restructuring. Dating one person for two years, three years, promising to marry that person, and changing your mind in the fourth year, even after engagement, to marry somebody else is restructuring your life. You have restructured your married life. You promise somebody I will marry you. You don't marry the person. You marry somebody else. That is, you can liken it to, what you did was restructure your future. So why is restructuring liking to, uh, to a war? Why are people saying that if you restructure Nigeria, when it, 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 somebody says we want to restructure Nigeria, then somebody will get up somewhere and say these are disgruntled people. When somebody says we want Nigeria to be restructured under Buhari, then you say why did the, the former president uh, and why did the former presidents not restructure Nigeria? Okay, fine. The, the former presidents, did they carry all the military position, all the uh, armed position, and give uh, to, uh, to Niger Delta people or to Yoruba people? So why didn't they do that then? If that is the argument, if you say, why didn't the past uh, uh, people restructure Nigeria? Then the ones that you're doing now that is wrong, recently, there was opening to employ uh, how many hundred uh, uh, personnel into the DS, am I right? Into the DSS. And less, less than 100, I think, was allocated to, uh, to the whole of the South. Why is that? What, what do you call that? And then you say, when people talk that 
they are blackmailing you. If that is me, we can count on our fingers and on our toes, in our teeth, the, the, the level of blackmail that the Niger Delta people endured so that power can shift to, um, to APC uh, under Buhari. You must allow people to talk. You cannot continue to threaten people. You can threaten a few people. You can't threaten everybody. Not everybody has sold their soul from the Niger Delta. Not everybody is a politician. Not everybody is looking for appointment. Yes, you have impoverished a lot. The majority of our people are impoverished. There is no two ways about it. We are impoverished. But it's only for a moment. It is only for a moment. And it happens because we allow it. It happens because we allow it. If the governors of the braised states, Bayelsa, River State, Akwai Bomb, uh, Cross River State, Edo State, Delta State, if these states come together and speak with one voice, with what is in the interest of the region and our people collectively, we will survive, we will live. So the fact, therefore, that they are not able to join heads, join hands, and work with us, the people, is what has kept all of us, including them, the politicians, where they are. Where they are. The, the fact that any time Somebody talks about um, restructuring. It becomes a crime. The, um, the fact that um, Christians are encouraged to disparage themselves and their leaders is something that they have chosen, and I'm not one of those um, uh, people, that they have chosen to accept. The way we are encouraged to, to, to accept, yes. I mean, when you talk about mismanagement of um, the little resources that we are supposed to be grateful for, that it has been mismanaged. Yes, I agree. It has been. And we must change, no matter how difficult it is. We must be seen by ourselves to first be doing what is right for us. So we have to change. I agree to that. But having agreed to that, it does not give an outsider the right to now convince me that because that has been the case, or because that is the case, that I have no right to make an argument in my favor against them that are taking the majority of what belongs to me. No, I don't accept that. Our lawmakers must do more. I agree, it is difficult. But we want to see them do more. We want to see them raise the bar, even if the, the bar will be knocked down. Let them first raise the bar. Let them do what they are supposed to do. And then we will back them. Now, the, this discussion of restructuring, it is either we agree to restructure Nigeria or we, 
the states, the ethnic nationalities, and the regions, and the southern bloc must agree to take the necessary steps. What are those necessary steps? All of us are shouting restructuring, restructuring. We have not even proven to the world that our people have understood what we mean by restructuring. We have not taken time to explain it to ourselves. The politicians have a responsibility to work with people like us, people like me, to be able to understand and transfer that understanding to our people so that our people can make intelligent choices for themselves. But when we, our leaders, our traditional rulers, our governors, our senators, are not even able or willing, except for, um, except for to be fair, uh, for somebody like um, the governor of River State that has taken some steps in, in certain directions that have created some changes in the, in, in the policy. And I thank him for that because he too could have just folded his hands in certain areas like, uh, like others do. But he has stepped forward and taken risks in some places where risks uh, should, uh, should be taken. He's not, um, I'm not saying he's perfect. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that as some of the things that, some of the decisions that he has made and some of the things that he has done have been the right things to do and have been the right decisions um, to make. Now, we need to be able to show to ourselves, our people, the woman in Abonima, through me, speaking to her in my language, through others, speaking the Ogoni people, the Ikwere people, the Akbaya people, the Egi people. If I don't call you, don't be angry, please all of us need to be able to go down to the grassroots and explain to our people why when they put yam in the in the ground and they harvest it why it tastes like kerosene or why it tastes like uh, petrol we need to explain it to them so that they can make decisions for their future and their children's future some of the greatest men in Nigeria, in the past and today, people that went to school in the 40s and the 50s, some of them were educated by women picking periwinkle every single day, by women frying gari every single day, harvesting cassava, fermenting it every single day, and sending their children all the way to the United Kingdom to study and come back. So, if a woman today in Abonima is not able to pick periwinkle and send her children to school, there is something very seriously wrong. And she needs to understand that and make her decisions. Oil companies are polluting our soil. We cannot farm and fish and educate our children. And yet, Oil companies give out scholarships, and the scholarships they give out, the majority of the scholarship go to people from the north. Yes, it goes to them. P, uh, is it uh, Petroleum Trust Fund scholarship, all those things, they benefit from it. But do they also benefit from the devastation? that we suffer, no. But it is all what in the name of one Nigeria. There is a warped system that has gone on for 100 years, and we are saying, let us change it. 
And then even our own people are calling us names when we say we want to restructure. Then somebody who somebody who cannot, even if he's brilliant, who cannot have a quality education because of the injustice of not restructuring Nigeria. He's sitting down somewhere shouting, eh, one Nigeria, we don't want Nigeria to break. Who is telling you that Nigeria should break? We're saying you should re restructure the country. If you refuse to restructure the country, then people have the right to make decisions in their own best interests. This is what we're talking about. Then I see young people that have finished uh, university education for whatever it is what, and, uh, are not able to, uh, to get um, employment. And these are the people that are shouting that uh, the, the people who want to restructure Nigeria, that if they restructure Nigeria, that uh, they will still steal the money. You can imagine that type of argument coming from somebody in his 30s, going to 40 that cannot get a job so that he can marry. Rich people, people in opposite parties, their children are marrying themselves. And then the, the very people that should see the point of what I am saying, and I have been driving for 22 years, are the same people that will be writing when I'm talking and making silly comments that they don't even understand, misspelling whatever they are writing, and saying one Nigeria, one Nigeria. Well, why can't you say one Ogoni? Why can't you say one Ikwere? Why can it not be one Ito? Why can't it be one River State, one Niger Delta? Why must it be one Nigeria? It is when you are, people are talking about patriotism, patriotism, patriotism. If you're not patriotic to yourself, you cannot be patriotic to somebody else, not to talk of patriotic to Nigeria. If you're not able to be patriotic to yourself, you don't understand what patriotism means. Patriotism should start with you. It's self-preservation. It's self-preservation. Your family, your children should be patriotic in your family. You should be patriotic to your wife. Your wife should be patriotic to you. That way you don't go outside and be having uh, your all kinds of things outside. So when the people shouting patriotism, they cannot even be patriotic in their personal life. They're shouting patriotism to Nigeria. Because you want to show that you are politically correct. No, you're not. You're politically incorrect. You're not politically correct. Politics should be about what you are able to do for your collective good. That's what politics is about. Because we're, even in your own home, there is politics. You should be patriotic to yourself before you can be patriotic to, to your community. Before you can, be, you must be patriotic to your community before you can be patriotic to your local government area and your state. Before you can now be patriotic to Nigeria. So when somebody says to me, I must be patriotic to Nigeria, I will ask the person, and I do ask, I must first of all be patriotic to where I come from. Papa, I cannot stand up from here in River State and go and be saying Abuja people must have uh, water when my people don't have water. Why will I be doing that? Why is the sense in that? So, what is going on? The call by all different persons in southern Nigeria for restructuring Nigeria is the correct call. It is the call, the time for this call is now. All the people who are saying no to the call for restructuring. When you say that me that want restructuring, I'm not patriotic. You that also don't want restructuring is also not patriotic because you're pushing me to the to uh, uh, to the war. You cannot ask me to make sacrifices that you are not prepared to make. You're not 
prepared to make sacrifices. What you want is the water must belong to you. You must control the water. That is what you want. In the name of politics, you will come and control my water that God has blessed me with. Is it my fault that God didn't put water in your place? I'm not saying you shouldn't have water. But if I have water and you want part of it, I cannot use all the water. Then you cannot come and take it by force. You cannot come and take it by force. You ask. What you don't have, you ask. So, the issue of restructuring, my people, I don't know how else to explain to you how restructuring must be. If you are in school and your teacher is turning up at 10 o'clock every day to teach you and classes are supposed to start at 8 and, um, and um, the classes are two, two hours long and he, the teacher for 8 is turning up at 10 every day. Won't you restructure? There has to be restructuring. He has to change his bad ways so that he will start coming to, to school to teach you at 8 o'clock. That's restructuring. So anything that works against you, you have to restructure it to work in your favor. Anybody that says no to you does not want your good. When we say restructure Nigeria, we're saying, let us do things differently. We're saying, let everybody keep what he has, whatever that thing is. I don't care if everybody owns a gold mine in Zamfara State. Let them keep it. I don't want it. Let them keep it. I just want to keep the remaining of my oil. People say that we will drink the oil. Yes, okay, we can find. Maybe oil is not useful anymore today. But maybe tomorrow they can find another way to turn it into water or wine or whatever. So even if oil is not useful, leave it there. Keep your own. That's what we're saying. Don't come and take it again. Okay, why can't... Why, I mean, how much gold that is coming from Zafar? How much? We don't know. Zafar is keeping it. Are they getting 13%? No. They struck a deal with the central bank, if what I read is true. I'll go and read it properly. I just saw it uh, at a glance, you know, the headline. So, as I'm rounding off, this thing, this today's topic is fully about restructure, but I have broken it up and highlighted to, for, uh, for the sake of emphasis to show why restructuring is necessary. So I've gone into what are uh, uh, the water resources bill. I've gone into, um, I've gone into restructuring, I've gone into referendum um, and uh, politics. Uh, the politics of 2023, I've gone into all of those things just to show um, how restructuring really and truly plays into um, what we're talking about. The refusal to restructure will take us to the point of a referendum. Once restructuring is totally refused, and of course, the the, the 2014 um, um, conference report is also rejected. And so many other things, it's been, everything we raise is being rejected. Um, we must conduct a referendum amongst ourselves. We, there is no point in saying that the government should conduct a referendum. And even as I'm rounding up, the issue of um, census has just dropped in my, in, uh, in my head. Census. This census have not has not been conducted in Nigeria. Nigeria is borrowing money, and so the the money that is set aside for the census is either borrowed money from China, whether they say it or not, is either borrowed money from China that we have to pay back, or 
it is um, money from the Niger Delta. Whichever way you look at it, the source of that money is Niger Delta. If they borrow it from China, it's Niger Delta. So basically, whatsoever that is happening in Nigeria today, the money is coming from China. Now, we the, the railway line that, is being, uh, that has been approved to, uh, to, uh, to go to... Um, uh, to go into Niger and all of those things. These are things that are not acceptable. And we must begin to make our voices heard that it is unacceptable because the money is coming from the Niger Delta region. Even if they say they are borrowing it from China, it is the money from Niger Delta that is going to pay back, not the money from Safara State. That is not what's going to uh, pay, it, uh, pay it back. So what we must do for ourselves is to actually conduct a referendum in our states, in our communities, and tell our traditional rulers and our governors what we actually want. That's a referendum. And once we have been able to tell them what we want, we, we are emphasizing the power and actually using and utilizing the powers that we have given them to exercise on our behalf in the country that is called uh, that is called Nigeria. So, on that note, I hope that I I have been able to make um, some sense of understanding and simplify um, the issue of uh, resource. I mean, uh, the issue of uh, reference. I mean, the issue of uh, restructuring Nigeria and then how we must begin to see that our next uh, movement must be towards um, making the voices of our communities, our local government, and our states heard um, throughout the world and in Nigeria, that this is what we want as a people. So on that note, I thank you very much um, for, for listening, and I hope that uh, you will tune in next week and um, and listen, people keep um, asking me to uh, to make um, at least one extra broadcast um, a week. It's not um, it's not easy, um, and I've not um, committed myself to uh, to doing that. It will uh, once I commit myself to doing that, uh, technically and otherwise, it has to be. A little bit, um, a little bit better than it is right now in terms of um, um, presentation and everything. But at least I'm still able to to push out things that, in my own little way, I believe is in our is in our interest, and um, I share it. I share it with you. I'm not imposing it. I'm not imposing it on anybody. I'm just sharing it. I'm sharing it with you. The, uh, the Niger Delta self determination movement. People have asked um, questions um, about the Niger Delta self determination movement. Uh, let me tell you that the Niger Delta self determination movement um, is on Facebook. It's an idea um, that follows the um, ideology of rights and justice and liberty and equity, uh, particularly self determination. Um, we're not able to, uh, to do things in the way that people are asking. I mean, people are saying, oh, why don't you come out and demonstrate? No, no, the, you, you know, people, you have to apply wisdom at every stage of the way in everything that you are doing. Um, it's not about coming out to protest. It's not, even people who are not protesting, SARS are picking them up for wearing durag and, and uh, wearing a particular type of shoe or, watch or whatever or color or shirt so you cannot um, be this is not the time to call people out i have arranged i have packaged the protests in abuja in river state in Bayelsa over the years you know so it's not an issue of fear or whatever it's an issue of wisdom and then uh, the other thing also is that um right now it is more an issue of sensitization and um, and uh, sensitization and also in intellect, intellectualism, putting forward 
the, the way things ought to be and the way that uh, they should be. And, and your rights, it's about rights, you know. And these things, um, I come out to say every opportunity that I have, they are justified. They are issues that cannot be uh, disputed. They are not lies. I'm not making them up. I don't, uh, it's not propaganda. It is true. They are historical. You can check the facts and things like that. So uh, for now, uh, the Niger Delta Self-Determination Movement, uh, let me assure you, is a strong movement. Just because we're not on the streets shouting, we no go agree. Um, we are at other levels talking uh, intellectually and speaking um, language when it needs to be spoken and to, and to other countries and um, people uh, people who understand and at the end of the day, people who will help us to make um, decisions that will be internationally uh, acceptable. So uh, don't worry. Uh, and let me assure you that uh, <laughs> the Niger Delta Self-Determination Movement, we have lawyers, we have doctors, we have the intellectuals um, in, uh, in our groups. And um, when the day that... Uh, they, we will come out, we will come out. And uh, right now, <laughs> we're out there, so I don't know what else people people expect. I'm speaking on the platform uh, of the Niger Delta Self-Determination Movement. Yes, I'm a container, um, but it is also better to, uh, to be able to, to work with something that um, nobody can infringe upon, if you understand what I mean, you know, so that I don't want. Uh, I don't want us to find ourselves tomorrow. Somebody says this tomorrow. Next tomorrow, another person uh, uh, says that. And if the times I've found myself in that position, I've put a stop to it. So on that note, thank you so very much. Um, next week, God bless you all. Bye. Get up, stand up, stand up for your right. Get up, stand up, stand up, stand up for your right.